It's such a privilege to be with you this evening, and I, I have to say one specific thank you to the leadership of this conference. Thank you for the heart you have for young people. On my heart all the time is this generation and desiring to see them be unconditional followers of Jesus Christ. And I want to say thank you for the vision and leadership of having the retreat in December. Uh, over the years, it's been precious to see the growth in lives. And I look out at some where they're not remotely the same person that I first met. I mean, I'm staring at Abel right now. Now it's on. I'm staring at Abel right now and just a representative of, of so many other lives. But I rejoice. I rejoice to see an older generation. I'm not calling you old. An older generation that has a vision for youth. So just from my heart, I want to say thank you for that. And thank you for, I, I mentioned that because of the offering and what you just mentioned as far as that being a priority. So may the Lord continue to give you vision and wisdom as you invest in the next generation. Now, the passage that I've been entrusted with this evening, verses 17 to 23, uh, is really a privilege to share. And if you've, if you've read through the book of Jude much, you'll know why. The book of Jude is a very heavy book where, uh, let's just say, Jude is really pushing some heavy material that, uh, that, that conflicts with the flesh, that's very convicting. But as we move into verses 17 through 23, I'm not saying it's easy, but you get a breath of fresh air. Because what he's finally doing is he's saying there's hope in the middle of a chaotic world. There's hope in the middle of lies. And this is the response a believer is supposed to have. Now, one title we could uh, use for the book of Jude would be Acts of the Apostates. Acts of the Apostates, because that's really what encapsulates the material of this book. And, and a couple of brothers, including my dear friend Rex, have been walking you all through this book of Jude. And we saw that in verses 1 to 4, we have this appealing that is going on to the church. And then we see from verses 5 all the way through 16, we see from an appealing... We see a revealing, a revealing of these false teachers. But tonight, tonight we want to look at a reminding, a reminding, an alert, which ultimately I pray will also wake us up. So let's read together from verses 17 through 23, and then we'll, uh, Lord willing, uh, learn what the Holy Spirit has for us to grasp this evening. Verse 17, but you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you in the last time there will be scoffers. Following their own ungodly passions, it is these who cause divisions, worldly people devoid of the Spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others, show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. Father, as we open your word, I have a couple things I would like to ask you for. The first is that if anything is said which is amiss, anything is said which is not of your Holy Spirit, I pray in your mercy that you would just remove it from our hearts. But Lord, whatever is from you, embed it on our minds that we might be eternally changed. And secondly, Lord, I ask that as we leave those doors in about 45 minutes, that only the Lord Jesus Christ would get any glory, because truly, only he is due the glory. So we pray all these things in his precious name. Amen. Now, as we jump into these uh, six verses and kind of walk through them, or seven verses, uh, we're going to see three things, three things. First, there is a reminder. Then we're going to move on to see there is a responsibility. And finally, we'll see that there is a rescue happening. But first, there is a reminder. Look at verse 17. Did you notice how it started out? It said, but you must remember. By very definition, if you are remembering something, it means it's not new. 
It means it's something that you've heard before. And this is also a tone that Jude has set over and over throughout the book. He's calling to remembrance. He's reminding them of something. And I want to challenge us this evening with a simple truth. The problem within our Christian lives, walking with the Lord, does not lie in what we do not know. The problem is in the application of what we do know, which ultimately we're not applying. I believe there's a danger, and when I say there's a danger, don't get me wrong. I believe we are supposed to be here, and I believe the Holy Spirit is using greatly this conference. But there's a danger of eating, 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 and not working out, of not getting your steps in. There's a danger when we consume, but we don't exercise. And I believe this is exactly what happens to the church. And what we see here is wanting new information or maybe perverting old information. And what is Jude saying? He's saying, I want to remind you of your common salvation. I want you to come back to the foundation of your, your most holy faith. He's saying, I, it's not like I'm some kind of intellectual here letting you know something new. I'm not giving you a new scoop on the scriptures, but rather I'm saying, remember. And that should be encouragement to us, but it should also be an exhortation, saying we have what we need. But the question is, are we surrendering to the Holy Spirit as he convicts us of the things we've heard? This weekend, my friends, we're hearing a lot of teaching we're hearing the word of God opened, and praise God, that is so valuable and needed. But watch out. If we leave and we do not apply, I would suggest coming to this conference was actually not only counterproductive, it actually was a dangerous thing for your walk because you're ignoring God's word. So when we see Jude start out by saying, but you must remember, beloved. We see there is a reminder. Now, also, when we say there is a reminder, uh, it, it makes me think of an example. And, and I use, I'm using my father as this example, but please know that I, I'm not using this in a negative context. I, I'm not doing it in any disrespect, in fact. Rather, on the contrary, I want to give you an example of how my dad responded to conviction. We grew up, or I grew up over in Senegal, West Africa, where my parents were missionaries. And in 1992, my dad started a radio broadcast, uh, which is now all over the Islamic world. And during those days, I remember dad was very occupied with writing these chronological radio lessons. And for good reason. It was a, a beautiful opportunity God had given. But sometimes my dad was writing all day, and then he would write into the night, and there were recording times, and it was very time-consuming. And there was one time during that period, and I didn't remember this, but my mother and father shared the story with me. Apparently, my dad was in there so much that it was actually affecting the time he would spend with family. And one time, my mother walked in there to the office, and in love, she said to my dad, she said, I, I want to remind you, you have a family. Well, my dad was deeply convicted by that. He was the one sharing the story. My mother didn't do it out of disrespect. She did it because she knew the heart of my father was for his wife and children and for the gospel. And you know, it, from that day on, my dad said things were different because he realized he did have a priority in ministry, and that was also his children and his wife. Now, I, I share that story Again, not to make things confusing, but rather for us just to see sometimes these reminders have to come. Why? Because we get so busy and not necessarily busy with the wrong th or bad things. We just get busy with things that take the place of the ultimate. And so Jude, in his graciousness, is drawing our hearts to this danger that exists, the acts of the apostates, but he also draws our minds to the solution for our personal lives. It's a call to focus on the eternal. So let, let, let me ask you a quick question here because as we go through this first little part, we see what are we gonna remember? We're remembering the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, and they said that in the last time, there will be scoffers. 
There'll be those who follow their own ungodly passions. Now, I, you know, we can, we can see these teachers. We can see these ungodly leaders doing it. And I have to ask myself the question, am I surprised? Am I shocked? Am I shocked by society or am I allowing the Spirit's conviction to say, this is to be expected, but I must know my place. In other words, this book of Jude is very fascinating because it's not a book where Jude says, hey, hang on, people are teaching this and their names are this, this, and this. So therefore, you need to do this to them. There's none of that. Well, there is the first part. He's saying teachers are doing this. He never names them, and he never tells you what to do to them. In a minute, we're going to see that we're to show mercy to those that are being trapped by their teaching. But why do I bring that out? During the last days, I feel there's a trap that the enemy would love for us as the church to fall into. He would love for us to start focusing on the false teachers rather than to be aware of their teaching and hence ignore what the Holy Spirit wants to do in our lives. It's much easier to talk about others who are wrong than to respond to the conviction of the Holy Spirit ourselves. And this is what Jude is concluding the book with. I mean, in a way, I'm surprised. He just spent verses 5 to 16 telling us how to identify false teachers. So it's kind of normal that we would say, okay, so what do we do to them? No, but you, but you. The attention, or I should say, the responsibility comes back to us. Are we going to respond to the word of God? So with that being said, that's the responsibility, but let's move on and, and let's look, or that's the reminder, but now let's move on to what I just mentioned, the responsibility. What is this responsibility? Well, let, let's look at verse 20. It sounds familiar, doesn't it? It starts out, but you. <laughs> Do you get the point he's making? He repeats what he just said, but you beloved. In other words, again, he's saying, I'm talking to you. This is not just a generic general statement. And, and what does he say? But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. Now, there's an incredible juxtaposition that happens in this passage. I wasn't here this afternoon because I was teaching in a different session, but I believe my brother Rex navigated verses 5 to 16. I, am I correct? And during that time, I'm assuming that he talked about three Old Testament characters that were distinctly mentioned. Now, again, I don't know what he said about them, so if I do any repetition, take that from the Holy Spirit. That is something to be embedded in your minds. But the three characters that are mentioned earlier, Cain, Balaam, and Korah, are actually, in a way, juxtaposed, in other words, contrasted with the responsibility we have. Now, I want you to follow this. Do you remember the three sins, which uh, or three categories of sin all the way back from the Garden of Eden that follow us through Scripture, and we can see it. We can see it with Achan. Um, he also fell into the same trap. We can see that when Jesus Christ was tempted, he too was tempted in these three ways. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, right? Well, if you went back to these three characters, you can see that these are the three temptations that are also being brought out in these three Old Testament characters. Uh, look first at Cain. Um, go back to verse uh, 11. It says, Woe to them, for they walked in the way of Cain and abandoned them. Well, we'll pause there. They walked in the way of Cain. Well, what was the way of Cain? Flip back for just a minute to Genesis chapter 4. Genesis 4. This is very significant, and it's going to make an impact in our responsibility. So, so please try to stay closely with me as we follow a train of thought for about five minutes here. So Genesis chapter 4. Well, what was the way of Cain? Look at verse uh, 7. God is speaking, or let's even go back to 6. The Lord said to Cain, and this is after his sacrifice was rejected, Why are you angry? Why has your face fallen? If you do well, 
Will you not be accepted? God's showing mercy to Cain. And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. Now, think about this. Sin is crouching at the door, and what? Its desire is contrary to you. What, the way of Cain was the lust of the flesh. In other words, his desire or his feelings were dictating his actions. You see that? His feelings were dictating what he ultimately did. He was angry, so in the end, he kills his brother Abel. But he goes off of feelings over going off of faith. Well, let's juxtapose that with now over in verse 20. And what does, uh, what does Jude remind the church? What's the opposite of going with your feelings versus going with your faith? He says, building yourselves up upon your most holy faith. Now, compare that with Cain. See, Cain went his own way. He went with how he felt about things. But what are we supposed to do? We aren't supposed to build on our feelings, are we? We're supposed to build on our faith. It's completely the opposite. I love this lesson. Recently, the Lord's really been drilling this into me because uh, oftentimes when you're going through a physical ailment like, like me with cancer, uh, there's many times I don't feel like doing something or all of my emotions are going one direction. But then I have to ask myself the question, well, hang on, that's just the way I feel. Feelings are fact, but feelings aren't always based on fact. And so I have to ask, Lord, what is your will in this situation? This is maybe the way I feel like responding, but what are you doing? That's why cancer has been one of the greatest blessings to me. I'm so thankful for cancer. Cancer's my friend. It's an amazing opportunity to share the gospel anywhere you go. People will listen to you when you're the one with cancer. It's great. I'm not, no rush to see it gone, but the point is we can either go off of the way we feel or we can build on our most holy faith. And what is that most holy faith? Well, the most holy faith was mentioned earlier. This is the gospel. This is the reality that God so loved us. That whole 316 and change last night. Right, Brother Rex? The, the, we have a foundation to build upon. And what that foundation includes is the truth of God's character, the truth of God's word, not the way I feel about something. So let me ask you a question. Are you making decisions? based on the way you feel. That's oftentimes what we see within these false teachers. They made decisions based on the way they feel. That's why Korah rejected the leadership of Moses. Why? Because he felt like he should have a higher position. Balaam obviously was going out after his comfort zone, which we'll touch in just a minute, because he wanted money over ultimately the ministry that God would have entrusted to him as a prophet. But you see, you have a choice tonight. You can go after the way of Cain. And just to be frank and honest, because I don't believe we have time for half-truths or beating around any bushes, we have a very short weekend. Can you ask yourself the question, or would you be willing to ask yourself the question, where are we getting sucked into the way of Cain? Where we truly are catering to our feelings versus building upon our most holy faith. And when I say that, I'm not just talking about doctrine. I'm talking about practice. Practice. What is our practice? The way we live, the way we give, the way we speak, the way we love. Oftentimes, it subtly creeps into our lives well, that's the first juxtaposition between these two parts. But who's the second character? Well, the first character, lust of the flesh, his practice was Cain. The second one is the lust of the eyes, and we have Balaam. We won't go back to Numbers, but if you went back to Numbers, about chapters 22 through 25, you would see the story of Balaam. And remember, Balaam 
this, this prophet uh, gets hired by Balak to go pronounce a curse on the children of Israel. And he tries and, and he's not able to. But then ultimately he says, okay, okay, God's not letting me curse them. But Numbers 25, he's like, I, I have another way of getting to them. And we see that in Revelation chapter 2 as well when Balaam's mentioned. And what was the way of Balaam? Get them to intermarry. And if they intermarry, then you'll have the same result you want, Balak, because God will curse them because they're not abiding by his way, his commandments, his standards of not intermarrying. Well, what's the lust of the eyes that's going on here? Well, Balaam went after the sake of gain. What does it say? It says, abandon themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error. He went after the love of money, didn't he? That was his passion. That was his desire. My friends, please know that I have none of you in mind when I say what I'm about to say. Not one. So if you feel targeted, take it from the Holy Spirit. I don't know your situation, and I don't know your life. But Balaam used spiritual things to gain earthly position. And all for the love of money. Now, we know clearly what the Word of God teaches. It says, he who loves the world and the things in the world, the love of the Father is where? Well, I'll tell you where it's not. <laughs> it's not in him. Now, isn't it fascinating that the juxtaposed response when we get to the end of Jude is not keep yourself in the love of money. It's keep yourself in the love of God. There's a very, very different perspective being presented here. I want to challenge myself and you that this love of money subtly creeps in just like the way of Cain. And what oftentimes happens is it's not that we don't do some good things with it. It's that ultimately the pursuit of that comfort zone controls our decisions. But when we keep ourselves in the love of God, what does that mean? Well, it, it doesn't mean keep yourself, uh, keep yourself being loved by God. Not, not whatsoever. Is God ever going to stop loving you? No. We know that God is love. This is his character. It's not so much that God loves you. That's true. But God is love. That's who he is. It's not just what he does. There's a difference. And I'm encouraged by that. But when it says keep yourself in the love of God... What really is it saying? It makes me think immediately of John chapter 14, verse 21. In John 14, 21, Jesus Christ speaking to his disciples says, He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he my father will love and I will love and will manifest myself to him. So what's he saying? He's saying, you have my heart. You have my heart on paper, and the disciples literally had it in their ears. He who has my commandments and keeps them, that's the one who loves me. Keep yourself in the love of God. When it's saying keep yourself in the love of God, uh, let, let, let me say it like this. Keep yourself in the place where you can fully enjoy the love of God. Because if you're not enjoying the love of God, you know what's going to happen? We're going to go after other loves, and that's exactly the way of Balaam. They forsook that way for the sake of personal gain. I want to ask you, are you enjoying God's love? It makes me think of a story that happened, uh, I, I think it was about seven years ago. I was traveling in Northern Ireland and speaking at a few assemblies. And, and at this one particular assembly, actually it was like a youth retreat, four assemblies at this point. And we were at this uh, just random house in, near the coast of, of Eastern Northern Ireland. And after one of the messages, a young lady came up to talk to me, along with one of the elders that was there. And uh, she said, Nate, I believe the gospel you're preaching, but there are two problems. I said, well, what are they? She said, well, first of all, I don't really love Jesus that much. And then secondly, I don't really hate my sin very much. Now, my immediate response was probably like some of you where I'm cringing inside like, that's terrible. You don't love Jesus much and you don't hate your sin very much. But the Holy Spirit did something very gracious to me. Before I answered that girl, 
it was as though he just stopped me. Now, it felt like time stopped because everything I'm about to tell you literally was what was conveyed before I responded to her. It probably was all instantaneous, but it sure felt like a pause moment. And the Lord asked me two questions. Before you answer that girl, let me ask you, Nathan, do you love me like you should? Lord, of course, I don't love you like I should. That's obvious. Okay, second question. Nathan, do you hate your sin like you should? Oh, Lord, obviously I don't hate my sin like I should because if I hated my sin like I should, I never would sin. Exactly. My relationship with you has nothing to do with how much you love me nor how much you hate your sin. Rather, you have a relationship with me because of how much I love you and how much I hated your sin. And that's why I went to Calvary. Now answer the girl. And I realized, keeping myself in the love of God is not a matter of emotions. Keeping myself in the love of God is not this feeling of like, oh wow, I love God so much I'm gonna raise my hand on every song. It has nothing to do with it. Keeping yourself in the love of God is not an emotional response to the scriptures. Keeping yourself in the love of God, listen carefully, is a decision to obey the Lord Jesus Christ regardless of when you understand why he's asking what he's asking. I, I hear from young people sometimes, and I'm sure, I'm sure you older folks say the same thing, okay? But I hear it from young people where, where they say, you know what, I'm going to follow God when I, when, I, when I really understand my decision. Or, or like right now, I just, uh, like, I, I don't feel like my heart's in it. I say, hang on a second. What do you mean by your heart's not in it? Well, I, I, just, I just don't feel it yet. That has nothing to do with anything. Faith responds to truth. It sure is nice when we have emotions. It sure is nice when we, when we feel close to God, but that isn't the point. When it says keep yourselves in the love of God, this is an invitation to know intimately his love and that comes through obedience when jude says keep yourself in the love of god what's he saying he, you you can't say be happy well i'm sorry like you i can say it but like you're not you can't just ah oh, now i'm happy but jude is saying keep yourself in the love of god he's in other words it's possible well it's only possible because it's not a feeling it's possible because it's a decision but let me tell you this, you will not keep yourself in the love of God. In other words, you won't keep yourself in the place of fully enjoying God's love if you have another love that comes before him. Because ultimately, your greatest love is going to control your heart. What does Jesus Christ say in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21? He says that where your treasure is, well, you can find your heart there too. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So we see with Cain, the lust of the flesh, this is his practice. And the opposite is instead of going with your feelings, you build yourself upon your most holy faith. The next one is the lust of the eyes, and that's your pursuit. And that's what Balaam did for the sake of gain. But we, instead of the love of money, are to keep ourselves in the love of God. But that third sin is the pride of life. And the pride of life is shown very clearly through Korah. It says, uh, back to verse 11, they perished in Korah's rebellion. Well, what did Korah want? If Cain wanted his practice to go off of feelings and Balaam wanted his pursuit to be the love of money, well, Korah wanted his position to be one of authority. He was not content with where God had placed him. He felt like he should be a leader in that journey across the desert. Who made you, Moses and Aaron, to be leadership over us? And we know the result. The result is he gets swallowed up by the earth. But what is the opposite that we see come out in this passage? Oh, how I love this. 
If he wanted authority, what are we to do? Look at verse 21. Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. See, that's the opposite of the pride of life. We wait for mercy. No, no, no. We understand thine is the kingdom and the glory and the power forever and ever. It's not ours. We wait for the mercy. Yes, a mercy we've already tasted, but also a mercy that we look forward to at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. When you read Jude, if you have to encapsulate the, the danger that these, uh, that these false teachers are presenting, I think the overriding danger is a usurping of authority over and over. Whether it be this archangel, uh, or whether it be like Michael's temptation with the devil, although he didn't give in. Again, authority. Or whether it be some of the earlier examples of, of these sons of men or these angels that uh, had improper relationships. The example of Sodom and Gomorrah, the example of Korah. Over and over, what do we see? We see people choosing to go against the parameters that God set in place. And what are we to do? We are to realize that even though at times the authority of Jesus Christ as Lord might not line up with our agenda or our plans, we realize that everything we're going through right now has a finish line and that finish line is the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ there's a song that my mother oftentimes jots to me on a piece of paper or when I'm living over in West Africa she'll send it to me in the mail and it's a song that says it will be worth it all when we see Jesus life's trials will seem so small when we see him one look on his dear face all sorrows will erase so bravely or gladly run the race till we see christ i wonder are we like cora always pushing and shoving and going for a higher place even within the local church it's amazing how we do it within spiritual areas of life or rather are we content to be faithful in the calling which we've been called, recognizing there is one Lord and recognizing our responsibility is to patiently wait for him? So we see clearly our responsibility completely goes contrary to the sins that have been laid out in this book. But that's the reminder and then that's the responsibility. But there is one more area to touch on, and that is the rescue. There is a rescue in this, in this passage, and it's a rescue that we all have a responsibility to participate in. Because again, be reminded, the conclusion of Jude is not go hang everybody, go kill everybody, get rid of false teachers, or just blast them out of the water. The result actually is one where we need to seek the dying, seek the lost, seek the blind, seek the confused. And we're going to see that come out. Let's read verses 22 and 23. And have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others, show mercy with fear, hating even the garments stained by the flesh. Now, I understand, based on your translation, some of you might see that as two categories of people, and some might see it as three. Don't be confused by that small difference. It does not change the interpretation whatsoever, or the, the main point whatsoever, of what Jude is conveying. But here I do see three. I see three characters. Now, let me give you two angles on these three characters because I really think it can be applied either way. And again, you know, that can be a discussion we have among ourselves. But once again, it does not change the ultimate understanding of the passage. I believe these three characters that are part of this rescue that's supposed to go on can either be seen as believers who have fallen into the lies presented in Jude, or they can also be seen as those who have never come to Christ but are being deceived. And again, study Jude for yourself and see, if, uh, see again if that understanding is mutual. But I do clearly, I seem to clearly see that that is how Jude is conveying it, and I'll tell you why. Notice the first category, and there are three categories of these people. 
First we have the doubters, then we have the deceived, and then we have the dangerous. We have the doubters, we have the deceived, and then we have the dangerous. First we have the doubters. Now what I love about Jude's approach is there is not this condemnation for those who doubt, but rather we as believers have a distinct responsibility to show or have mercy on those who doubt. Why are we having mercy? We're having mercy because we've been showing mercy. But what really is it to doubt? You know, uh, among, uh, among youth, once again, just this demographic I love, there's oftentimes young people that come to me and they, they'll, they'll, they'll open up and say, I'm really doubting, and then fill in the blank, some truth about God. I wonder, have we created or have we allowed local churches and families where young people can express or older people can express doubts? Now, when I say that, I'm not encouraging doubting, but I want to talk about doubting for just a moment. Because doubting in and of itself is not necessarily a bad thing. Why do I mean? Well, there's a lot of false teachers out there, right? So I hope when you hear things or read on social media that sometimes you doubt what you're hearing. If not, you're gullible and being sucked in by every wave of doctrine and every fake news that's out there. You get the point. But doubt. How do we as believers show mercy or deal with doubt? I want to encourage you with something to do with doubt. You see, doubt usually presents itself as a question, as in there's something that we are just not sure about. And, and, and I want to tell you, this is nothing new for even godly individuals. Do you remember the greatest born among women, according to Jesus Christ? Who was that? John the Baptist. Well, John the Baptist uh, is a prime example of one who had doubts, and not before his ministry, but actually as he came to the conclusion of it. When you come to Matthew chapter 11, he's sitting in this prison, which is right on the edge of the Dead Sea, on the Jordanian side today. And in that prison, his disciples come to visit him. And when they come to visit him, he says, I want you to go find Jesus and ask him a question. And this is the question. Are you the coming one, or should we be looking for someone else? Now, it's interesting. He uses the word coming one, right? And he's referring back to a prophecy in Isaiah 35. So, like, he's actually using a messianic title. He's saying, are you this coming one, or are, are we blind? Are we supposed to be looking for somebody else? So then, John's disciples go and find Jesus. And I imagine that they conveyed that question to him right away. But notice this. Please don't miss this. Jesus did not answer their question in the way they wanted. Instead, what did Jesus do? It says he showed them some stuff. He healed the blind. He cleansed the leper. He brought hearing to the deaf. He raised the dead. He made the lame to walk. And the poor had the gospel preached to them. Now, why is that significant? Because in, back in Isaiah, it says that the coming one was going to do exactly those things, that list of things. So Jesus, instead of saying, yes, 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 I'm the coming one, tell John to stop doubting. He didn't do that. Instead, Jesus took John to a destination of truth with his doubting. He says, John, I'm not going to answer your question the way you want it answered, but instead I'm going to show you who I am. And he takes him on this, or takes the disciples on a journey of showing them, and then says, go back to John and tell him the things you've seen and heard. Tell him all these things. Now, why does Jesus do it like that? Well, John still has to make up his mind. Am I go? I mean, like he already obviously had followed Christ his whole life, but is he going to die in this confidence? Is he going to choose to find peace? And it sure seems like he did. But you know, when it talks about having mercy on those who doubt, I want to encourage you that when we doubt, because I'm guessing there are some doubters out there. I'm guessing some of you are struggling right now in your faith. And maybe some of you, maybe young people especially, you came to Southwest Conference 
not necessarily because you even wanted to. Maybe you came because your family said, we're going. And maybe you have serious questions in your mind tonight. I want to challenge you with something. Jesus does not necessarily give you the answer to the question you're asking, because maybe the question you're asking really is just irrelevant, where you're trying to create problems in your faith. Instead, let me ask you this. Has God failed on anything he said? Somebody once told me after I had cancer, it was a girl from Germany. She said, please stop being so happy about cancer. She said, you should be mad at God because basically he's forgotten you. And I thought about that. I thought, where has God broken any of his promises to me? Where has God actually been unfaithful? Where has God remotely not loved me? See, the only way I could ever accuse God is if I was making up the scenario, if I had false expectations. My God has been absolutely faithful every step of the way. He has not failed me in one regard, nor does he owe me anything. Everything I have is mercy, his mercy, his love. And the thing about doubts is this, am I taking my doubts to a destination of truth? Oftentimes my doubts are simply there because of my own desires rather than what God has said. So when you find doubters around you, I want to encourage you, instead of trying to answer all the questions, let's get back to what we know. For God so loved the world. He gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. You might remember in the concentration camps of Nazi Germany, there was a lady, um, two ladies, the Ten Booms. And as they were in this concentration camp, they used to hold Bible studies in their barracks. And it was really a blessing because the Nazi guards wouldn't come in the barracks because there were so many lice that had infected the room. And so they didn't want to risk getting it themselves. So these ladies were able to hold open Bible studies. And one day as they were sharing about, uh, about the death of Christ, they said, God's love. And this one Polish lady who used to be part of an orchestra in Warsaw, she said, how can you say your God is love? And she held up her mangled hands and she said, look, I used to be first violinist in this orchestra. And now with the Nazi beatings and work camps, I'm ruined. How can you say he's love? And Corey's sister responded, I don't know why he's allowed what he's allowed. She dealt with her doubt. She said, I don't know. But she said, I know the God you're accusing is the same one who sent his son. And he had his beard ripped out by men. He had his back beaten like a plowed field. He had his hands and feet pierced, his side pierced through with a spear, a crown of thorns on his head, and he took the cup of God's wrath for you and for me. And then she said this, if you know him, you don't have to know why. Have mercy on those who doubt. Remind them of the foundation. Remind them of the gospel. And so we see the doubters. We just have a couple minutes left, and so quickly we'll look at the deceived and the dangerous. With the deceived, what does it say? Have mercy on those who doubt, verse 23. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. Again, these are the deceived. These are those that have gone on with these false doctrines. They've been pushed along in this river of, of, of man-centered ideologies. We see it all the time. And, and let me just suggest to you, and I suggest to you in love, there are probably individuals here today who have been swept away by deception. And when I say by deception, what do I mean? Well, please, we live in, I'll give you one example of deception. Are you ready for this? Because watch out, you're thinking, well, I can tune out for a second because I'm not deceived. Okay? What do we say to people? We say, Brother Roy, may God bless you. But what do we mean? Well, oftentimes when we say, may God bless you, we say, God has really blessed you. What are we saying? We're saying, well, 
God gave you a really nice house. I have no clue where you live, so I'm not targeting your house. But God's giving you a really nice house. Because we walk in his house and we're like, man, God's blessed you. Or maybe as a phenomenal job, we say, God's really blessed you. Now, I'm not saying that the hand of God is not in that. That is not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is that according to Jesus, which I like to go according to Jesus. According to Jesus, he said, cursed are you who are rich now. Cursed are you who are, who are laughing now. Cursed are you men who, when men say well of you now. Cursed are you who laugh now. You can find that in Luke 6, verses 24 to 26. And then he switches it up and he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are those who hunger, or the blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are you when men persecute you and revile you and say all kinds of evil falsely against you on my account. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. What am I saying? I'm saying watch out. There's a lot of streams of deception that are going on and we can get carried away thinking God is all about my earthly pleasure. Just like Balaam. We have to stop. And we have to ask ourselves, am I the one that needs to be snatched out of living a wasted life? Please, I'm not saying you're not saved. That is not what I've said. I'm saying, are we being carried about by culture instead of Christ? There's nothing wrong with money, but there's something dreadfully wrong with the love of it. We should examine ourselves. That's what Jude is saying. But you, but you, but you. That's really where I want to bring things in at the end. We have one more category, and the last category are the dangerous, and you know who they are in the sense of these are the ones who are not just trapped by it. They're the ones promoting it, and when you try to come help them out, guess what? They're going to try to suck you in. It says be careful hating even the garment stained by the flesh. Be very careful. It doesn't say don't show mercy. In fact, it says the opposite, show mercy. It doesn't say don't talk to them. Talk to them, care about them, love them. Jesus Christ died for them. Oh, but be so careful. Get back to that common salvation. Get back to that most holy faith. That faith that says we wait patiently for the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. So where do I want to end things? Well, I want to end like Jude ends. Tomorrow morning, Lord willing, you're going to hear a conclusion to Jude, verses 24 and 25. But did you notice that when we got to this portion of Scripture, and specifically when we looked at verses 20 and 21, what did Jude tell us? He said, but you. The first thing is this. He says, go inward, but you. In other words, look inside. Keep building upon your most holy faith, praying in the spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for this appearing. This is inward. This is our response to the word of God. And that's what I want to encourage you. It starts inward. But then verses 22 and 23, it's outward. It goes from inward to outward. Now it says, have mercy, show mercy to the doubters, to the deceived, to the dangerous. And then verses 24 and 25, we go from inward to outward to upward. I want to challenge you. It doesn't start on the outward. You don't need to start by a rescue mission. You start with repentance. It starts with me. It starts with me recognizing where, so subtly, I started falling in love with the world. Do you remember what Christ says to the church at Ephesus? He says, you've left your first love. He, he doesn't say, you lost your first love. <laughs> no, 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 no. Look at the word. It's not you lost, it's you left. Some translations do put lost, but it's left. 
If I leave my keys somewhere, I did not lose my keys. I know where they are. I just left them on the counter. My friends, Jude says, remember. I'm telling you nothing new tonight. I'm asking, have you fallen into the traps that our culture and society want to integrate into our faith? This race is almost over. Jesus Christ is coming soon. Very soon, we're going to be with the Lord. Let's run the race faithfully, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising its shame, and is now sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So I close with this. My beloved brethren, remain steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Inward, outward, upward. Christ is coming soon. Keep your eyes on him.